Hi. Excuse me, just uh, enjoying my money. I, um, you've probably all at least heard of Jesus. Well, let me tell you about an encounter I had that, uh, an encounter I had with Jesus that rocked me, that completely devastated me. Uh, I saw him while I was traveling, and so I, 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 I tried to play it cool, but I couldn't. I just ran up to him. I've had this burning question for some time um, about something he'd said about eternal life. So I ran up to him, and I just, I, like I said, I couldn't help it. I, I fell to my knees. And I said to him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he looked at me almost without thinking, and said, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So I felt a little, a little sheepish, like I'd said something kind of silly or misguided. But before I had time to speak and explain myself, Jesus continued. He said, you know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your honor your father and mother. And at this point, I started feeling a little more confident. Uh, I was actually feeling quite confident. And I told him, teacher, I have kept all of these things since my, since my youth. And then he looked at me with a smile, almost as if to say, oh, that's cute. But, <laughs> but not in a patronizing way. More compassionate, knowing, understanding. Like he saw me, he got me, and he said to me, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. My jaw dropped. I was speechless. I felt frozen, devastated, sad. I didn't know what to say, and so I just, with my money, walked away, on the verge of tears even, a little angry, but mostly just sad. And so I sat down, just barely within earshot of Jesus, not intending to eavesdrop. I, I, I didn't really want to be around him at the moment, but I could overhear Jesus, clearly inspired by the encounter he had with me, talking to his disciples. And he said, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. I could hear the collective gasp of the disciples. No kidding. But Jesus kept going. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Still silence. I could see a bunch of open mouths. One of them spoke up clearly a bit agitated by what seemed like a little bit of hyperbole, and said to Jesus, well, then who can be saved? Jesus said, almost pleased with the question, as if it perfectly set up his punchline, said with warmth and clarity, with people it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Maybe you should give me that. Thank you. You'll be better off without it. <laughs> wow. Jesus. I mean, talk about demanding. So he starts off it's simply enough, you know, here are the commandments. The guy asks him, here are the commandments. And Jesus says, well, do these things. And the guy says, well, I, I've done all those things. And at that point... As Matt has suggested, he could probably feel pretty full of himself, but then Jesus goes on. He says, really, there's one thing that you need to do. You need to give up everything. Everything. And come follow me. Give your money to the poor. Give up everything. Wow. Harsh. That's a lot to ask. 
Now, in this, as the story is referred to in the Bible, it's often described as the story of the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler, which is interesting because that suggests not only wealth, but perhaps power as well. Now, I'm not sure who this guy was. I'm not sure what Jesus knew about him before they met, although with the shades and the scarf, it would have been evident that this person had money and style. <laughs> so at some level or another, Jesus probably recognized that he was talking to someone probably outside of his social caste. And yet this man was coming to him for advice. This man was coming to Jesus for advice. And Jesus just told him the truth. He said, you know, you're practicing very well. You've got the practices down. But there's just this thing that must be in the way of your spiritual life. And that is your wealth. Now, in the Gospels, we're fairly used to, I think, the, the various injunctions that we receive, the, the, the expression of the desire to help the poor, that we have a responsibility for other people. It's that kind of the social, just the social action part of the question of wealth and power and money. But I don't think that this story, that that's exactly what that's about. I don't think this is about uh, income inequality. I think it's about spiritual health. Of course, Jesus suggests a perfectly good thing to do with that money, give it to the poor. That would be the thing to do, to share your money. But it doesn't seem to me that the point of the story is really about social justice. It feels to me like it's a question of spiritual health. That there was something in the way for this young man of wealth and power. There was something in the way, even though he was a, a faithful follower of the laws of the commandments, there was something in the way and it seemed to be money. Now, none of us have experienced that, have we? That money might be in the way. No. no. <laughs> so isn't it good that Jesus addresses this question? Because it needs to be addressed. We need to address it. We need to look at it in our lives. We need to look at the way that we deal with money. And we need to look at the question of health, both financial and spiritual. Because when it comes down to it, it's not so much about, you know, the money itself. It's about how that is used. How is the money used? How is it held? Who's got it? Who doesn't have it? How do we feel about it? How are we protecting it? Are we generous with it? You know, these are all the questions that we need to ask. These are the questions that I think Jesus is asking of this young man with the sunglasses and the expensive mohair scarf. If we are going to have clarity in our spirit, we are probably going to have to have clarity around money. Now, when you hear this story of the rich young ruler, I don't know if immediately you think, uh-oh, here's a story where Jesus is talking to me. I mean, I don't think of myself as a rich young ruler. I'm certainly not young. But, on the world scale, I am rich. I am. And, truth be told, I have power. I am rich, and I have power, and I used to be young. <laughs> so this could have been a story about my younger self, at which point I was not probably as rich or powerful. So this is not a story about somebody else. This is a story about us. I just think that that's the first place to start. We need to put ourselves in the place of the rich young ruler. We're not going to be the people who are sitting over on the side saying, yeah, tell it to the rich guy. Yeah, give it to the, yeah, tell that rich guy what he needs to do. That we probably need to put ourselves in the position of the rich young ruler. And we need to look at what Jesus said and try to figure this out. And here's the confession. I'm not going to give everything away. 
I mean, I could, I could stand up here and say that I might, or exhort you to. But the truth is that I'm not. So then what? If I'm going to listen to these words and take them seriously, especially because we see in this person, and this is the part that I like to identify with, the part, the, the part of the person who is good at the practices, keeping the commandments, being faithful people. We are all faithful people. And we can take some pride in that. That's the part I want to identify with. And I also need to look at this other part. What am I going to do about this money question? And it seems to me the path that we need to take is to look at the relationship between financial health and spiritual health. And that right alongside that are these questions of inequality. So it isn't separate from my financial and spiritual health. It is not separate from other people. It's completely interwoven with them. So even though we think of this path as being a solo path. This, the spiritual path we often think of as a solo path. In fact, it's a community question. It's a community issue. Now we're at the time of the year where we're looking at questions of stewardship and we're asking about pledges and we're imagining how much we might commit financially to the health and well-being of this institution and all that it does in the coming year. And of course, that's a money question. And it raises those questions. Well, what can I afford? What can I do? Am I, do I feel, uh, do I have an idea? Do, is it, can, can you win? And what's it? And yeah. And it's kind of like that. At least for some of us. Some of you may have already filled out your card. You know exactly what you're going to do. And you feel great about it. But it does raise that question. I'm going to give some money away to the church. And how does that affect me? So if we're going to be faithful, and we're also going to be honest about our own economics, then we have to figure out, well, if I'm not going to give it all away, and I don't want to discourage you from doing that just because I can't, <laughs> but if we're not going to do that, what are we going to do? And for me, it often comes down to that question of security and insecurity. Do I have enough? Do I have enough that I can give some of it away? If I give some of it away, am I just giving away that part that feels comfortable to do because it feels like there's extra there and it's not going to affect everything I'm doing? Or does it dip into, I have to make choices about what I'm doing in order to decide to give perhaps a bit more? It comes down to a question of security and insecurity. And those are not easy questions. Those are not easy questions. We are moving into a time, I think, when a whole generation of people are going to be entering into their elder years without protection, without financial security, because the systems are changing. So fewer and fewer people have pensions, Hopefully people are taking care of themselves, but uh, corporations are moving and lots of businesses are moving to, to situations where people are managing their own retirement a little bit more. Are we doing that? Are we looking forward? Are we taking care of those, that period of time? But what I see is a whole generation, the possibility of a whole generation of people moving into this period of time where they're almost certainly going to face financial insecurity. And one of the biggest challenges of that period of time is figuring out, well, how much do I need in order to survive? Because how long am I going to survive? It's a simple question. And if I'm shaped by fear, if I'm shaped by insecurity, then I'm going to make different choices than if I find my solid standing in my faith and my spirit and a certain amount of trust that it is enough. There is enough. 
Again, I don't think this is just an individual question. And yet we deal with our finances pretty much as individuals. This is not a subject we talk about often with other people, I don't think. We might not even talk about it very well with the people that we're living with. And this seems to me to be a block in the way of our spiritual health, that we don't have light and space and air around this conversation. Jesus brought it up. The rich young ruler did not come to him and say, well, what should I do with my wealth? That was not his question. That was Jesus' question. And yet, it's something that I think we all need to entertain. My hope would be that there could be more space and light around that, because that would lead not only to more financial health, in my opinion, but also more spiritual health, because we're telling the truth. We're telling the truth. I believe in sharing. I believe in sharing. Now we might change that language and say, I believe in the redistribution of wealth, which sounds a little bit different, doesn't it? And in the current political climate, as I've probably said to you before, you hardly hear anyone saying, yes, we should share the wealth. But that is, in fact, what we're called to do. Even if we're not going to give it all away, we should be giving some of it away. And probably more than we feel like we can, just because we're not always as solid and secure in our faith as we might be. We're not as solid and secure in whatever our own financial situation or financial planning or whatever we have said. We may not just be secure. Together, however, I think something completely different can happen. And I'm realizing, and in, in a kind of clarity that I've not had in years before, that this process of looking at pledging in this particular organization, institution, community, to look at that as a, a community act. I mean, think about it. We don't uh, say, okay, turn in your pledge any particular time of the year. We say, this is the time we're going to do this, and we're going to do it together. There's a phrase that I've just heard recently, collaborative generosity. And that is so appealing to me because I can feel the strength of not only what I have to give, but combining that with what other people have to give. And I just know from my experience that if you take any particular group of people, there are some people who have a lot to give and some people who may not have as much to give, but it doesn't really matter because together we can give. So I invite you to just consider, as you, as you look at this question of the finances of this church for the coming year, that you might just imagine that it's not just what you're giving, it's that you are making a co collaborative, generous act with a whole group of other people. I know that I'm always encouraged by the giving of others. What I see, the generosity, I see in other people. And it calls forth my own generosity in ways that I cannot be secure on my own. I can be secure when I rest myself in this community and in God's hands. Yesterday I was with an out-of-town friend and we were coming to church and he was asking me a little bit about the church and he said, well, is this, um, this he was, I was telling him about my position here and he said, well, is this a, a, just a job or is it like a circle of friends? And I said, wow, it's really neither one of those things and a whole lot more. This is 
a grounding place for me. This is a place that I've been connected with for 37 years. This is a place that, uh, that I came into as a completely different person. And now, here I stand. This church is completely interwoven with my, my own creativity, my own sense of leadership, my own ability to share my gifts, my, my own needs and desires for community and connection, and, and, and to find people who are, who are all faithful, just like that rich young ruler who knew how to follow all the commandments. I need to be surrounded by people who are willing to be following the commandments. This is not a common thing in the world to find groups of people who are following the commandments. And yet it happens here. I sometimes talk about this in kind of an institutional sense that my, one of my desires is to support this place, this institution. And, and, and again, this year I've just been thinking, you know, it, the only important idea with the idea of institution is that at one level or another, there's a bigger thing that continues on even though the specific personnel might change. So First Congregational Church of Berkeley has existed for 140 years. Obviously not the same group of people. Some of you, I look around, I see you've been in these pews forever. <laughs> Maybe in the same pew. <laughs> and others, I can guess that you're here for the first time. Well, isn't that an interesting and powerful thing? Where's this, this thing that exists that people can come to on any particular Sunday morning and be part of a community that follows commandments and sings songs and plays bells and has children singing and that prays together and that listens to funny Bible stories and is willing to entertain the rantings of its minister. <laughs> this is a place that is preaching love, and that's really the thing. And so here's the question. Are we going to love our money, or are we going to love with our money? Amen. Amen.